Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Gospel Forum podcast. We are a collective of Reformation-minded Christians, and if you're not familiar with the Gospel Forum, please take a moment and visit our website, thegospelforum.com, where you can find all kinds of blog articles and other podcast uh, episodes that we have done. So my name is Dan, and we're going to go around the table here, just in case you don't know some of these guys. And by the way, this is also on YouTube and on Facebook. Uh, but of course, this is also available on your favorite podcast catcher as well. So if you're listening to this audio and want to see our ugly mugs, go ahead to uh, one of those places and you can see how we look like having this conversation. But we're just a bunch of brothers around a table um, talking about theology and life and want to be a blessing to the local church. So we'll go here to my far left. And we'll go around the table and introduce these men. I'm Micah. I have the privilege of being one of the pastors at Shoreline Church here in Bradenton. My name is Pilgrim Benham and also an elder at Shoreline Church. I am Sean Otto. I'm the lead pastor, senior pastor here at Bethel Mennonite Church. Josh Sherrill, associate pastor to Providence Church in Lehigh Acres. Amen. Well, thank you brothers for com- for being here today and recording another episode. It's been a while. And uh, we do want to get back into the swing of things. And we're probably going to be releasing about two episodes per month uh, on average going forward, just so you know what to expect uh, from us. And, of course, we'll also have articles uh, on the website from time to time, probably a handful from uh, month to month there. So be on the lookout for that as well. Well, the main topic for today's episode is how sound doctrine impacts all of life. And so we just want to take a minute to digest that, to see how doctrine is impacted, or how our lives are impacted by doctrine. Is there a separation of the two, or are they the same? Is all of life theological, or is that just a certain aspect of your life? So who would like to begin the discussion with just maybe answering some of those questions that we just talked about? Well, I think that's a danger to separate uh, what you believe versus how you behave and to have these uh, distinct categories where you say, well, yeah, that's my, that's my Sunday life. That's my church life. That's, uh, that's relegated. In fact, a lot of people would want to divide sa- sacred and secular. Let's yeah. just have those be a nice, neat little categories. You can uh, do your, your Sunday thing with your little group of uh, religious folk, but don't allow that to enter the public square. Um, but we would argue that we would want to see, uh, you know, what we believe affecting every area of our life. We wouldn't want it to, uh, to because that's hypocrisy to say, yes, I, I, I believe one way, but then I practice or I live a completely different way. Right, right. I would agree. I, I mean, all of life is theological uh, because it flows out of what we believe. Um, Even an atheist is theological. He just doesn't believe in God. Um, but it, we believe something about God and that affects how we live. And so... We don't often hear it termed that way. All of life is theological. And like Pilgrim said, I think uh, a lot of people try to compartmentalize, um, but everything flows out of our belief in theological system. I think that's a great point. You know, and it's been said before by many people, everyone worships. Mm. It's not whether you will worship, it's who you will worship. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. Even an atheist is theological Mm -hmm. and sometimes themselves, they they are their own God Mm -hmm. Uh, or whether they worship the environment or another you know false ideology mm-hmm. or something like that very good yeah yeah I would I would I mean I obviously agree with with what these guys have said here um, we're we've been in first Corinthians at Providence for a little while on Wednesday nights and <clears throat> last night we were in, in chapters eight through through nine and Paul's statement that he is all things to all people you know that, that gets mm-hmm. misused a lot but the idea that he's communicating there is, is that he, he does these things. He waives these rights for the sake of the gospel. Everything's intentional. Everything's purposeful. So how we live is ought to be a reflection of what we believe. Mm. Um, and without that, we're living inconsistently and we're misrepresenting Christ and the gospel. Yeah, if you don't really live it, do you believe it? And mm. the evidence would mm-hmm. probably say no. Mm-hmm. I love this quote by John Calvin. It's from the Institutes. It's also in this little book on the Christian life that you could buy on Amazon. Um, this is what Calvin says. He says, We have been given priority to doctrine, which contains our religion, since it establishes our salvation. But in order for doctrine to be fruitful to us, 
It must overflow into our hearts, spread into our daily routines, and truly transform us within. Even the philosophers rage against and reject those who profess an art that ought to govern one's life, but who twist that art hypocritically into empty chatter. How much more, then, should we detest the foolish talk of those who give lip service to the gospel? The gospel's power ought to penetrate the innermost affections of the heart, sink down into the soul, and inspire the whole man. So this is exactly what we're talking about, what Calvin so wisely articulates here in the Institutes. So just for sake of framing this conversation in a helpful way, uh, all the men sitting around this table are (coughs) elders at local churches. Let's first see it from a ministry perspective. Why is uh, doctrine important in the life of a pastor? Obviously, we know in his teaching ministry, but let's just incorporate that into the pastor's life and ministry as a whole. Who would like to go from there? Uh, I'll jump in here from, we see it several places in scripture. Uh, just one one passage that comes to mind is uh, Titus 2.1, as we see um, the Apostle Paul writing, uh, writing to Titus, my true child in the common faith, uh, instructing him uh, leaving him there in Crete so that he would continue to pour into those churches to see elders uh, raised up and, and leading those churches. But in chapter 2, we see very clearly, he says, As for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And then from, from there, he goes into these categories of, of how we are to live that out. Mm-hmm. So teach the sound doctrine, and then it's lived out in the older men, in the older women, the children, the families, uh, in, and um, it, even slaves and masters. Mm. Uh, and so he goes through all those categories. Uh, and so that all begins from that, that ministry perspective uh, that uh, we as pastors, we continue uh, in this, this line of faith um, that was set forward by Paul and, and, and lived out in Titus and Timothy and others. So it has to come from the leadership of the church to begin with, uh, and then we see how it filters down from there. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good. Yeah, Paul says to Timothy, um, so you know, also pastoral epistle, 1 Timothy 4, 16, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Another translation says on the doctrine. So there's a, there's a, a, a focus that we're to have, we're to pay attention, we're to heed um, those two things. We're to heed you know, our own walk with Christ, but we're also to heed the doctrine um, that, that we're teaching in our ministry. And um, and, you know, of course, we've, we've got articles on sound doctrine, we've got articles on, on scripture on the website, but uh, we continue as a ministry to emphasize the importance of what we actually teach, you mm-hmm. know, that we're not just getting up and not that this is the episode for that, but we're not just getting up and communicating topics, but we're teaching the full counsel of God. So right. that doctrine flows out of a good exposition of all of the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that passage in, in 1 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, of course, like you just said, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. But then he says, persist in this. Mm-hmm. Persist in it. It should be something of a daily discipline, a daily heart check of the pastor to make sure that his heart is right and his teaching is in accordance with sound doctrine according to what the scripture rightfully teaches. And the promise there is by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So for the, for the pastor, not having a life that is impacted by doctrine is detrimental to the church, detrimental to your family, detrimental to the glory of God and his work through you. Um, you know, not that our lives are, salvi- are you know, sal- salvific. Did I say that right? Mm-hmm. Um but they definitely have an impact on on what people see in us and the examples that we lead. And so um, there, there's such a, I don't know why, but growing up, growing up as an early pastor, of course, I was all stuck in that seeker-sensitive movement. And doctrine was always downplayed. You know, it's always about being relevant mm-hmm. and uh, exegeting culture. And why doctrine was never brought, I never understood that. Uh, perhaps it was because it's boring, it's not as entertaining or fun or, you know, to in that mindset. But 
perhaps that's why we see a lot of the trouble we see in the local church today is because doctrine has been downplayed from the pulpit, from the church's disciple making responsibility. Mm. To boil it down very succinctly, pursuing and teaching sound doctrine equals life. Yeah. Uh, and when you don't have that, that is going to equal death. <laughs> um, yeah. And you could say death, it could be the, 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 a matter of salvation, really. It could be as serious as that, but it can also lead to uh, to uh, your your walk with the Lord being very dead uh, and not having much life there. Right. As well. I had, a, I had a, when I lived in Indiana, I had a, I had a pastor friend uh, that I was talking with, and I was asking him, "How, how would you teach this particular doctrine?" And he looked at me and he said, "Why are you teaching doctrine? Just tell people how to live." Mm. And that. <laughs> That separation yeah. uh, is a dangerous thing because eventually, how do I tell people how to live if I don't know mm -hmm. the doctrine right. that's supporting that and, and underlying that? Exactly. And so I think to Micah's point, those two have to stay together. Doctrine equals life. Everything we do flows from it, yeah. right? Yeah, I think and if we look at both of those passages in Titus and in Timothy, um, in the context of what he's saying there, it's surrounded by practicing those things. Mm -hmm. It's surrounded by and places a premium on being obedient, living lives that are worthy of the gospel. Um, you know, he says, going back to Titus here for a moment, uh, he said that <clears throat> in chapter 2, verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope. And then later on, speaking of Christ, he says, he gave himself to redeem us from all, unlaw uh, from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Mm -hmm. So the doctrine mm -hmm. itself is evidenced by the lives that we live. And those who are called to ministry are called to exemplify the implications of that doctrine in their life. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we would all agree, that, as you said earlier, our lives are not, our, as a pastor, our lives are not salvific in and of themselves, and we still are repentant uh, Christians as we're dealing with our own sin. But nevertheless, to your point, we're called to set an example. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so our, our congregations are looking to us to say, mm -hmm. you teach this. How does that look in real life? Mm -hmm. uh, show us. Yeah. We do it imperfectly, but we do it to sh give them an example of what Christ meant when, he's, when he lived us right. out. Yeah. There's no quicker way to kill a church than just to starve it from sound doctrine. Mm. I mean, how can a church grow in holiness and godliness and affections for God without his word? Mm. I mean, we see that all throughout the Gospels as Jesus commanded his people, especially in the Gospel of John. I preached that through a couple years, well, last year and the year before. And Jesus again and again told his disciples, if you're going to follow me, you're going to do what I say. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to heed what right. I've com commanded you, you know. To do and those are the people who truly follow me it all revolves around God's word God's law God's commands and this is I think why Paul tells Timothy again in 2nd Timothy 3 he says all scripture is breathed out by God of course there's a doctrine of inspiration mm -hmm. um, but what is the what is the point of God speaking his word that it is profitable in the Christian life, it's mm -hmm. profitable for ministry. How? For teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. Mm -hmm. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So mm -hmm. how anyone can separate the responsibility to preach sound doctrine to our people from just live how to you know live life, or here's five steps on how to be stress-free, or a lot of <laughs> yeah, these sermons that you right, hear, you know, right. uh, which are just kind of, it's just moralism mm -hmm. wrapped up nicely in a nice package. Um, but at the end, it's, it's just serving to starve mm -hmm. God's people. Mm -hmm. um, if Scripture is profitable, then, then really we are bankrupting our people from holding back mm -hmm. what is true. Mm -hmm. Right. In that way. Very good. Well, I think part of what you were said there uh, is, is good to point out, too, that if it's just a moralistic package of five things to ease stress or to make you happy. Ultimately, I'm relying on myself to make that happen, that's right. and, yeah. and that's going to fail. Yeah. Uh, so scripture says, no, rely on Christ, who is able mm -hmm. to strengthen you, to give you what you need to live life. Um, and so it always comes back to, what is it, doctrine? What does the Bible teach? 
Amen. Yeah. Amen. Mm-hmm. Very good. So that's from a ministry perspective. Let's look at it from, we have, you know, probably most of our listeners are not pastors. They're, um, you know, faithful members of, of our churches or churches in, uh, you know, around the country. What, how, would, how would you encourage them to pursue sound doctrine, especially maybe when they're looking for a church or, uh, or maybe find themselves in a church that isn't teaching in accordance with what God has said, um, and how that translates itself into the workplace, into the school uh, where they go to, in their neighborhoods where they live, in their marriages, etc. How, how would you encourage them to take that more into their arena? Yeah, I actually have an example. I, I spoke last night for about an hour on the phone with one of our listeners, um, a friend who found us online, and um, we've become social media buddies, if that's a thing. Great. Right. Um, and he's a, a young man who was in the, the NAR and Bethel uh, kind of movement, if you would, and uh, has cerebral palsy. And, um, you know, he has been told over and over in his family, if you had enough faith, then you would just, uh, you would pray and you'd see your son or you'd see yourself come out of this uh, right. disability. And so he was exposed to the American Gospel uh, documentary and uh, just really got exposed in a great way to sound mm-hmm. doctrine. And part of that uh, discovery led to some frustration and a little bit of anger with the the bad doctrine that he had been taught, yeah. but also a love and an appreciation for God's word. And so we, we had a great chance to just chat about his future last night. And um, one of the things we talked about was growing, you know, in God's word. And this is a part of discipleship is growing in what we believe and what we know to be true. Second uh, Peter one, one of my favorite verses all the way from three to really uh, 11. Uh, but the, the thing I want to emphasize uh, was that Paul said, or Peter says his divine power is granted to us all things uh, for life and godliness hmm. through the knowledge of him by which he's granted to us these uh, precious and great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Uh, so the idea there is we grow in, uh, in our knowledge. Mm. And as we grow in our knowledge of, of sound doctrine, this is going to affect every area of life. He says, if you don't know, if you're not adding to your faith these different things, then they're going to keep you myopic. They're going to keep you ineffective and unproductive. So mm-hmm. um, in the case of uh, this dear brother, like he's, he's learning... Um, you know, that his prayer uh, does not necessarily, um, you know, it's not necessarily answered in the affirmative, but God is still good. Mm. That doesn't mean his faith is inferior. And so as he's growing in doctrine, he's, he's you know, growing in joy. He's growing mm. in, in faith. He's growing in peace uh, and, and being able to trust the Lord in mm-hmm. these hard real life mm-hmm. scenarios. So, yeah, I would, I would say to the listener, to the average, uh, you know, lay person, we grow in doctrine because as we do that, that affects every uh, aspect mm-hmm. of our faith. I think that's a great example, Pilgrim, especially you know when we deal with the matter of suffering and how to endure suffering in, in the Christian life. And um, of course, naturally, the first thing we want to seek after is healing. You know, we don't want to feel like this. Mm-hmm. But of course, if we believe God is sovereign and God has God has a purpose for it, for our sanctification and for His glory. We know that there is something deeper there that we must seek for. And in that is being content in God in, mm-hmm. even during the suffering. Mm-hmm. So if you have false doctrine, which says it's God's will to always heal people, for example, like the you know, prosperity gospel of faith healers teach, then that's really going to affect your life. That's going to lead to discouragement, <clears throat> even further despair. Mm-hmm. Like you're doing something wrong. You're the one to blame. Mm-hmm. For this, instead of trusting God, being uh, uh, content and satisfied, even through your suffering, which mm-hmm. doesn't happen overnight, but of course is a joy produced by the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Again, there's Scripture, Paul, you know, the thorn in the flesh. I mean, so many examples we can give mm-hmm. uh, about God's grace being sufficient, and that's a great example. And that American Gospel film. If you haven't seen it, please watch it. Mm-hmm. I think there's still a one-hour free version on YouTube that you can search for and watch. I encourage you to do that. Uh, many examples in that film of people who've been impacted by false doctrine in that film and how that's expressed in their lives. Mm-hmm. Very good. Mm-hmm. I believe it comes down to, for for all of us, uh, a, a high view of God's Word. Mm. It has to come down to that and... Um, are we are we in God's word? Are we seeking to have a, a the attitude of a Berean, 
who's, mm-hmm. who's searching these scriptures um, to test uh, what is being said in, in our own churches, but in, in people we hear on YouTube, on, on whatever we hear. And yeah. so the we get off track when we are uh, putting our trust in a pastor or a personality or in a movement or in a, a, a denomination, a church, whatever it may be. Um, we, we devalue God's word and we, we uphold a person or uphold an idea. Mm-hmm. And so when we get back to a high view of God's word, that will... Uh, as we as we are faithful, that will that will fix, Lord willing, some of those those issues if we have put God's word in the preeminent place that it needs to be. Because it, again, if we look at at Titus, uh, the result of instruction in in sound doctrine it comes with a skill to be able, as it says here, to rebuke those who contradict it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, again, this is written to the pastor, but but all of us as believers. Um, if we know God's word, we know sound doctrine. When things mm-hmm. come around, uh, we know, hey, that's 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 incorrect. That's not God's word, and we can mm-hmm. rebuke, we can rebuke and 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 um, and and. Uh, I think he even says to place. silence them. Yes, right? silence, mm-hmm. them, right? silence them. Silence right. them is what Paul says <laughs> yeah. into Titus. Yeah. In a similar vein to what Pilgrim was pointing out, I think all of us know people who've been um, brought out of false teaching by Paul Washer's. Mm. sermons mm. um and you know that, that's even brought up in american gospel mm. and it's god's grace that he uses um that kind of media to to bring people out of that but to go back to your question how would we encourage uh, believers who are not in ministry to pursue sound doctrine i think the the pattern that god has given us is clear in scripture mm. uh, paul says imitate me as i imitate christ there's a structure there's someone they're following there's a leader they're following and I, I've seen personally people who've come out of false teaching listen to sermons online, and yet they never commit to a, a church that's yeah. teaching sound doctrine. Mm-hmm. And so what happens? They become puffed up in, in this new knowledge that they have, right. and they, they run rampant with it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and again, where Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ, right before that, he warns them, knowledge puffs up, mm-hmm. but love builds up. Mm-hmm. So there's a way in which we can have knowledge of sound doctrine and without the practical application within the community of the church, uh, mm-hmm. it doesn't serve us well, nor does it represent Christ. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. oh, and you asked a good question earlier. You said, if, if I'm an average person, how do I know if my church is? And so if, if we watch Paul, the way Paul wrote his letters, he would start off by teaching doctrine and then he would switch to, here's how that looks in real life. So you take the book of Ephesians, for example, the first three chapters, it's all about doctrine, chosen by God, forgiven by God, we're one in God, and then he leads into, here's not how that lives. So I think if I were the average person sitting in my church, uh, listening to sermons, I think I'd be asking, have I ever heard sermons from Ephesians one to three, or does my pastor only ever jump to four through six? Um, because there can be a disconnect. Now, I know that's a specific example, and I think all of us here uh, preach kind of through books of the Bible, yes. which is, I, I think, a valuable way to do that. But if I'm only ever hearing this one little verse here, uh, but it's not connected to doctrine, mm-hmm. that's a good thing to be asking, well, what does my church believe? Uh, how, how do I evaluate this ministry? I would at least start there. Yeah. No, I think that's an excellent point that you, that you both bring up. So sound doctrine, the purpose of sound doctrine is not to make you an intellectual. Mm -hmm. And I think we, and some people especially who are still in the cage stage, (laughs) uh, might think that, you know, for a moment, that it's just, it's all about intellectual. But again, there's a translation there that it goes, it goes from your mind to your heart Mm -hmm. in the way that it's expressed in your life, like Calvin says in this, it must overflow into our hearts. But here's the thing about that. You aren't meant to do sound doctrine alone. Mm-hmm. That's right. Paul wrote these letters to groups of Christians. Of course, mm-hmm. Timothy and Titus are elders in that church, that, you know, men he was training uh, specifically. But he wrote to the Ephesians, to the Colossians, right, to the Philippians, Corinthians. Sound doctrine is meant to be expressed in a local community of disciples, mm-hmm. of other believers hearing the word. Um, you know, going through the word together, applying that word, repenting together, holding each other accountable. And so the best way to apply this and translate into your life is make sure that you are in a group of people and not some ivory tower just getting more facts and figures about Mm -hmm. the Bible. Uh, 
it, you have to have an outlet to express that in community with one another. Yeah, I think a very practical way to address that in your fellowship is just to ask the pastors is, or the, you know, the lead pastor, is doctrine important? Mm. And just see how just they ask answer the question. That. Because yeah. it, simple, simple question. <laughs> yeah. it should be absolutely, but it should affect all of life. That should be the answer. Mm-hmm. If the answer is well, not really, you know, uh, we we need to we need to have practical versus uh, doctrine. Then I think how they answer that is very critical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In Romans chapter sixteen, verse seventeen, we see uh, the impact of this in the life of the church. Paul's. We've been teaching through the book of Romans uh, over a year now, and we're, we're right in this chapter. But um, Paul is giving his final instructions and greetings um, to those he knows uh, in, the, in the Roman church there. And he says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Mm-hmm. Avoid them. Mm-hmm. And so we see how uh, a, a love for sound doctrine uh, affects the life of the church and can save the church from division mm-hmm. uh, in that way. Mm-hmm. And then, um, Josh, to your point earlier, uh, for obedience and living this out, in verse 19, he says, For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. Mm. And so we see two aspects there that come out of Mm -hmm. uh, sound doctrine. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Well, anything to wrap that, any other thoughts that we left unattended or any, or did we do that? Okay. (laughs) I'll circle back here and just say that, um, you know, you brought up Romans, and Romans 12 is where he's shifting from the doctrine to the application. And what does he say there? He says, I appeal to you, therefore, this is verse 1, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That, I mean, that's the application yeah. of what, all that he's brought at this point. And he says, do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal of of your mind. Mm-hmm. Well, how is our mind being renewed if not by sound doctrine? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and he, he prays the same thing for the Colossians in Colossians 1 and in verse 9. He says, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So as, here's the purpose, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Mm-hmm. Back to the Calvin quote, without knowledge, without the knowledge that comes from the scriptures, we cannot live a life that's pleasing to God and it will not be fruitful for the kingdom. That's our ultimate goal is to live lives that are pleasing to God. I, I like that. And in fact, it, Paul does the same thing when he moves from Ephesians 3 into Ephesians 4 and he says, he put off the old self um, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, well, again, that inner self, the heart, how do I know what that renewal looks like? Well, it looks like chapters one to three. Yeah. So here's how you put on the new self. Um, so again and again, we see that pattern uh, of doctrine moving into devotion or moving into life. Mm-hmm. Amen. Very good. Amen. Yeah, a book you might want to check out is in uh, part of the Nine Marks Building Healthy Churches series called Sound Doctrine. Subtitle is How a Church Grows in the Love and Holiness of God. I believe it goes right in line with what we've been talking about today. As we wrap up this episode, though, we have a special segment inspired by Dr. Stephen Nichols on his podcast, Five Minutes in Church History. From time to time, he asks uh, theologians on his podcast, if you were taken to a deserted island and had to take five books with you, what would they be? The Bible you already have, so don't mention the Bible. Uh, today we're going to sp- we're going to do one person per episode over the next few episodes. Today we're going to ask Pilgrim. So Pilgrim, what five books would you take on a deserted island with you? Okay, so the Bible's there already. Bible's already there. Um, yeah. I would, you know, jokingly, uh, how to survive on a deserted island. <laughs> that that Seems logical. That's probably a good one. But yeah. if we're talking about books that uh, we would want every Christian uh, to read, and ones that I try to read continually. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would go Pilgrim's Progress. Um, so I, I try to listen to that every or mm-hmm. read it every two years okay. is my goal. Um, there's just so much, and you read Spurgeon, he quotes all the time as if people already you know, know the references. Um, and so we've moved away from that. But there's so much there allegorically. Um, Besides the Institutes, I think that might be the most influential book Mm-hmm. And probably if you span the theologians yeah, that have come after Bunyan, Edwards quoted yeah. 
but you know, yeah. Bunyan repeatedly. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, knowing God, J.I. Mm-hmm. Packer. Um, mm-hmm. So just a real foundational. Um, and there's uh, Mark Jones wrote Knowing Christ more mm-hmm. recently in the last uh, ten years, which which is great. So maybe between those two. Um, of course, Desiring God. If I had to pick one, uh, that's a contemporary author. Um, J- obviously, I love John Piper. Um, and then Valley of Vision is more of mm. a prayer book, mm-hmm. and yes. so it's not a book proper. It's a mm-hmm. it's a compilation of Puritan prayers, right. uh, but I, that's used you know multiple times a week. Uh, often I pray from the pulpit a, a you know small snippet of a of a prayer from Valley of Vision and pretend like it's me praying it. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then I got to go uh, a little bit of of relief, a little bit of relaxation and fun. I would do the complete far side. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, Gary Larson. There you go. You yeah. need to laugh on a deserted island. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotta stay entertained. I think a lot of his there several sketches that have guys on the deserted. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. Right. I'll find myself <laughs> in the actual <laughs> that's right. comic. All right. So for review, you got Pilgrim's Progress, Knowing God, Desiring God, Valley Vision, and The Far Side. Yeah. All right. Very good. <laughs> well, on the next episode, you'll see you'll hear another deserted island top five. And so anyway, well, this has been another episode of the Gospel Forum podcast. Thank you for watching and listening. And make sure you check out our website for more information, thegospelforum.com. But until next time, here we go, guys. Ready? Keep Keep on on reforming. reforming.